So you want to learn about physics, don't you? Then you came to the right place. In this video, we are going to teach you the basics, which is measurement. It's the first step in collecting data and can often be messed up. Like my teacher once said, once your data is right, I will give you your sprite. But I never got it. So before we start, you're going to want to know some of these definitions, or all of them. I'd recommend all of them. So accuracy, precision, error, uncertainty, random error, systematic errors, instrument slash measurement, uncertainty, data uncertainty, and precision matching. Hello, this is Ben, and I'm going to explain the 1.2a standard to you. The objective of 1.2a is to state the fundamental units in the SI system. It is also referred to as the metric system. MKS stands for meters, kilograms, and seconds, while CGS stands for centimeters, grams, and seconds. There are seven different quantities that we measure in 1.2a. They are considered as length, mass, time, electric current, thermodynamic temperature, amount of a substance, and luminous intensity. Their separate units are meters, kilograms, seconds. Welcome to standard 1.3a. This is essentially state values in scientific notation and in multiples of units with appropriate prefixes and perform calculations with numbers written in scientific notation. So basically this is just numbers in scientific notation because uh, units are dealt with in the last standard um, and as long as you have the formula sheet. The formula sheet has all the prefixes that you need, so when you see numbers like times 10 to the third, you know it's kilo in front of the unit. So as long as you can read that chart properly, you don't really need to know the multiples of units and such in the standard. So just know that that chart is there for you. It's on the back of the answer sheet. Well, the back. It's technically the front of the answer sheet, but it's where the units are and the constants so if you don't know where those are, you best start looking now because they're very, very useful. And it has a lot of the constants that you'll need and the prefix chart that is useful for dealing with numbers in scientific notation because sometimes you just don't know what you're doing and also when you need to do unit conversions, which will be standard 1.5a. So I'm only going to be working out a couple of small examples. Um, just enough so that you know how to condense a number into scientific notation, expand the number into standard notation, and then do just some standard addition. It's not any harder to do um, op any other operations in scientific notation. Just make sure you put your parentheses where you need to go if you are using them in a formula or an equation or anything like that. It's not really any harder. It's mostly common sense and knowing how to type the numbers in, which is what I'll basically be showing you with my calculator. So example number one is to condense the number 2 trillion 543 billion into scientific notation. So it's 2 trillion 543 billion, which is quite a few many zeros, and obviously you can see that's kind of a little bit hard to write on your paper. So what we're going to do is see at the end of this number there's a little invisible decimal point, and this decimal point is what we're going to be moving using, and scientific notation will tell you what number to put on the exponent. So see, if you take it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and it puts the decimal point right here. And when you're writing in scientific notation, you want one digit in the ones place and all the rest are after the decimal. You don't want to put like 103 times 10 to the third because that's a little bit boring and it's also just not how you do it. So, you know, reduce it to like the smallest number possible, but not like 0 0.254, it's just the ones digit and then all the rest of the decimals. So see, we have this and we move the, the decimal point and we count it out loud 12 places, which means you have 2.543 times 10 to the 12th. And the 12 is what goes in the little exponent. And I'll show you how to type it here. And when I hit enter, it's not going to show up as that because I think numbers past like 10 to the 10th show up as just scientific notation, but 2.543, and then see you're going to put the second key right here, and the comma key, which is right here, see there's a little blue EE above it, and that's what's really important, so make sure you hit second 
so you don't just type commas in your numbers, and the E stands for times 10, and then we're going to put 12, because 12 is the number that goes right here, and that's what's really important, it's the order of magnitude. So this part right here is called the numeral, and then this is called the order of magnitude, and that's vocabulary that you don't really need to know, as long as you know this is the number, and this is how big it is. So when you type that, it doesn't give me a big number, but if you do something like 5e8, it will give me the number with the zero, so that's really important. So if you aren't sure of your counting and you don't want to feel like recounting for some reason, you can always just type it into your calculator if it's smaller than like 8 or 9, and it will tell you how many zeros are, and if the number looks right, then you probably got it right. So the second example I'll be doing is expanding a number from scientific notation to standard notation, which is what we call regular numbers. Um, so we have on the review sheet that's in front of you is 3.2 times 10 to the 7th. And so what you do for this number is you write out the number 3.2, and you see this little decimal point here, and you're going to take it to the right seven places. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so every empty space here between the points that I've drawn goes a zero and then the little invisible decimal point goes here on the end, but you don't really write that in actual numbers. And so that gives you 32 million. And that's how you expand a number from scientific notation to standard notation. So this last example, example five, I'm just doing example five number one because that's really all you need to know and the rest is just common sense. It's how to type operations with scientific notation into your calculator. So it's really easy. So if you see 5 times 10 to the third plus 6 times 10 to the third. And it's super easy. All I have to do is type the numeral 5 e3 and then the operation obviously sometimes it'll be a little more difficult if you're doing numbers in scientific notation in formulas you will have to include parentheses and whatnot it's considered its own number so you will need that I'm sorry I can't get my camera to focus and then plus 6 e3 because that means times 10 to the third and when you add it together you get c 11,000 and you're going to want to put that in scientific notation as well if it's a big enough number. Here it's just 11,000, but you can also take the decimal point and move it over four places to get 1.1 times 10 to the fourth. And that is all for standard 1.3a, because if you are subtracting numbers or dividing numbers or multiplying numbers, it's really pretty much exactly the same for every operation. Alright, so this is standard 1.4b, determining the data uncertainties and results, and use correct significant digits for precision matching. So, uncertainty is the net effect of the errors on the data collected. There are two types of uncertainty to consider in a lab, instrument and data uncertainty, which are part of your definitions in 1.1a. So, the definition for um, instrument and data uncertainty is uncertainty due to the overall precision of the instrument used and or the data collection method. This is generally in your data table in a lab report. Instrument uncertainty is two subcategories, minimum uncertainty and estimated uncertainty. The minimum uncertainty that any measurement can have is 10% of the smallest decimal place in the measurement. For example, the minimum instrument uncertainty for a time measurement of 5.35 seconds is 0.01 seconds. Alright, so estimated uncertainty takes into account the way the data was collected. For example, human reaction time is involved when using a stopwatch. And it's better to have a reasonable estimated uncertainty in a lab report. Um, the uncertainty would be in the tens place because reaction time or human error has a greater uncertainty. For single measurements, it's usually up to the experimenter to estimate, and we'll do an example later on. Next is data uncertainty, which is another definition. So when collecting multiple trials, the uncertainty range is determined by the data collected. This is usually calculated using average plus or minus half the range of the data. So basically, data uncertainty is found by the highest measurement minus the lowest measurement times 0.5. Determining uncertainty. There's two ways of reporting uncertainty. 
absolute uncertainty, and relative uncertainty, which I'll explain later on. Absolute uncertainty is the uncertainty in a measurement expressed in a unit you're measuring in. An example is if you measured the distance across the front of a building to be 52 plus or minus 5 meters, the 5 is the absolute uncertainty. Alright, next is precision matching, which is a definition. The definition is when the value of the last significant figure matches between the measurement and the absolute value. An example is if the measurement across the front of the building was written as 52 plus or minus 5.0 meters, this would be a precision mismatch since the uncertainty is to the tens place, but the measurement is to the ones place. Now we're coming back to relative uncertainty, which is the uncertainty in a measurement expressed as a percentage of the measurement. Using the previous example about the building, we, would, we could record our measurement as 52 plus or minus 5 divided by 52 meters, or 52 meters plus or minus 10%. 10% is the relative uncertainty in this case. The 5B is determine the proper conversion between different units of quantities. So here we have imperial units and then metric units, just because, you know, maybe you need both. So 15 inches, we're going to use the standard train track method that's been taught by both our science teachers this year. So you have 15 inches, and you can put the little one underneath or not, it doesn't really matter because it's implied. And then you're going to put inches in the bottom because you want it to cancel out, and there, and you have one foot because you want to turn to feet, and there's 12 inches in one foot. And so what you're going to do is it reads just like an operation where it replace, so you multiply this with this, and you get 15, and you divide it by this, and you get 15 divided by 12, which gives you 1.25, so when you convert 15 inches to feet, you will get 1.25 feet, which is pretty simple, and it's basically the exact same thing. So for metric units, it's almost the exact same thing, but there might be prefixes sometimes because metric can do that. So if you look on the back of your formula sheet, just remember that nano, the little n in front of your unit, in this case coulombs, means times 10 to the negative 9th. So we take 5 nano coulombs and we do our train track, we put nano coulombs on the bottom because we want to cancel it out, so 1 nano coulomb is equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 9th coulombs, since we want to turn it into coulombs. And what we do is we just take our calculator, and using our skills from 1.3a, what we're going to do is multiply 5 times 1 times 10 to the negative 9th. And when we get that, we get 5 times 10 to the negative 9th. And when we put that together, it gives us 5 times 10 to the negative 9th coulombs. And that is basically it for unit conversions in 1.5b. So if you just remember how to do this, and remember to look at the prefixes and whatnot on your formula sheet and the orders of magnitude, you'll be all good since I'm sure, since we all went through the same physics and chemistry classes, uh, unit conversions have pretty much been done to death by now, so you should be a master. It is always good to know how to estimate instrument uncertainties and deduce the random systematic errors in a given situation. For example, Let's say that a student is measuring the length of our classroom with a 30 centimeter ruler. State and explain some random errors the student might encounter. Well, some possible things would be like moving the meter stick, or how the student looks at the scale. By that, I mean using the wrong side of the ruler. Then, estimate and explain the uncertainty the student might expect to find in this measurement. On a ruler, the farthest to the right of the decimal point it can give you is to the tenths place. So when estimating the uncertainty, it is good to keep it in the tenths place. It, al it is also good to not go too high like 0 0.7. Keep it around 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something new. If you enjoyed, how about hit that like button and subscribe for more random, unpredictable content.